Szanowni Państwo, pragnę powitać na dzisiejszych obchodach byłych więźniów Auschwitz i innych obozów oraz ocalonych z zagłady. Witam premiera Rzeczypospolitej Polskiej, pana Tadeusz Morawiecki, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Poland. Witam przedstawiciela Kancelarii Prezydenta Rzeczypospolitej Polskiej. Witam reprezentatywa the Kancelarii of the President of the Republic of Poland, minister Wojciech Kolarski. Witam przedstawiciela państwa Izraela. Reprezentatywa of the State of Israel, Madam Ambassador Anna Azari. Witam przedstawiciela Federacji Rosyjskiej. The representative of the Russian Federation, Mr. Ambassador Sergei Andreev. Witam ambasadorów. May I welcome the ambassadors and the representatives of the diplomatic corps. Witam przedstawicieli kościołów i wspólnot. May I welcome the representatives of churches and religious communities, including the representatives of the Jewish communities as well as the representatives of the Roma community and the representatives of national, regional, and local authorities. May I welcome the representatives of representatives of institutions and organizations as well as individuals who join us at today's ceremony. O zabranie głosu proszę panią Marię. May I ask now Ms. Maria Hull, the former inmate of Auschwitz, to take the floor. Who am I? I have three different names and four surnames. As for the date of my birth, there are several different dates, and I still do not know the exact date of my birth. But I was probably born in the summer, because otherwise I wouldn't have survived. A village somewhere in Belarus. In that period, there is mother and five children in the woods. The village was burnt down and my father joined the partisans. The Germans, according to my mother, were trying to force her to contact my father, but because she refused, they made her dig out a grave for herself and the children. 
But this didn't happen. She had to stay with her children in a dugout hole in the woods. Later, she told us how she would dry out diapers on her own body. She was caught probably in winter and was put in the Vitebsk camp. She stayed there for around three months, according to my sister, who wrote, wrote down the mother's memoirs. From there, we were taken to a transit camp. I have no information on how long we stayed there. In June 1943, we were taken to Majdanek, according to the information provided by the Auschwitz archive. In September or October 1943, the older children, that's my sister Valentina and brother Kola, were sent to Łódź. Mother stayed with Raya, Volodya and Gala, Gala, that is me, until 1944. We stayed there until 1944 and my mother worked on a farm. As the Eastern Front was approaching, on the 15th of April 1944, we were transported to Auschwitz. My brother, Volodya, was placed in Monowitz, that is Auschwitz III. My mother, sit, sister and I had numbers tattooed on our forearms. My mother got the number 77251, my sister 77253, and my number was 77252. When later they started looking for me and my sister, they would give wrong numbers. I didn't find any information about my sister's stay in the camp, how long she stayed there, what she looked like and what happened to her in the camp. Perhaps we were not together. The only thing I know is that she was alive on the 19th of January 1945. This was the last time that our mother came to see us. It was Sunday. She could see us only once a week and only only for half an hour. My mother was sent to Ravensbrück and from there straight to Russia, that is Belarus. Speaking from today's perspective, it was impossible for her to start looking for us back then. Her poor health, no housing, the harsh experience of the labor camp and the hardships she experienced after she returned to her homeland, as well as the news of her husband's death, he died on the 4th of April 1944, all that didn't allow her to start looking for us. Only months later the children came back from the orphanages and it wasn't until 16 years later that she could start looking for us. My older brother served in the army in Vladivostok. My younger brother was also a soldier. They had contacts with the foreign press, including the Polish press, hence the first letters, the first correspondence. The response from the press was also good. Now when it comes to me, we were taken from the camp to Harbutovice. For many years, I didn't even know about it. I found this out from the older children during the first meeting of the Auschwitz children. Our first reunion was organized by the curator, Tadeusz Szymański, who started looking for the documents about the children who were in Auschwitz. Thanks to him, we could learn about our past and contact the members of our families if they were still alive. From Harbutovice, we were transported in horse-drawn carts to Butcher. We arrived in the evening. This was my very first memory. We entered a large, well-lit room, a dining room, and it was warm in there. The space was filled with children, they gave us food, I got milk in a mug, but I wanted to have it in a bowl, and I remember their astonishment and surprise, but they gave me a plate. I have very fond memories of butcher, children in white rooms, bird feeding in the winter time, drinking fish oil in the mornings. I tried to be first in the line as uh, they served us uh, fish oil from one spoon. And 
and my favorite food were eggs, and once I misbehaved and pushed in the line to make sure I would get my bread and scrambled eggs, so they put me in the corner as a punishment. I remember the people who took the photos of the numbers tattooed on our forearms. I also have a recollection of our baptism in a church organized by the nuns. On that day, I was given a name and a surname, Halina Zalewska, but I still didn't have my birth date. Around 1947, I was taken by Ms. Marczewska. Unfortunately, as a mother and a widow, her living conditions weren't too good, so she turned to her friend, but he couldn't take me in either. He asked his friend. His situation was a bit better. They were a married couple with no children, and they owned a shop. In the autumn of 1947, I was accepted into the family. They were very helpful, especially my foster father. He was very understanding and helped me greatly in organizing my new life. Unfortunately, he had a heart attack and a stroke in 1954. He had aphasia and had to learn how to speak and write anew. I was of great help for him at home, as we had the best contact. In 1956, I was formally adopted, and my name was changed to Maria Dombek, born in Oświęcim, which wasn't true. The father's condition improved, and there was more, more contact with him, but unfortunately, he had another heart attack in 1959, and he died. For me, it was a great shock. I tried to help my mother as much as I could in the household chores and in the shop. And suddenly, a year later, the situation changed. I was at home, alone, and the radio was on. The program was called Music and the News. And suddenly, I heard mother is looking for her daughters with the numbers, and one of these numbers was mine. What a shock it was. My Polish mother returned from the shop, but I didn't tell her a thing about what I'd heard, and the next day she wanted me to go with her to the shop. But on the way there, I told her I had forgotten something, and I ran back home to listen to the radio again, as they would rebroadcast the program on that hour. Unfortunately, I was too late. On that same day, my grandmother visited us, and two days later, she was going back home, and I walked her to the railway station. I told her about everything and I asked her to keep this to herself, but unfortunately she got off the train and she came to our home with my mother. And that's how it all began. It's not easy to have two mothers. A friend of mine passed information to the radio that I was in Krakow. Ever since I can remember, I longed for the people and familiar faces around me, but I couldn't find them. In Butcher, although I was surrounded by many carers, I missed the face and the very notion of mother. I knew that my parents had died, but I didn't think too much about it. I didn't ask myself who I was, who they were, and so on. After all, I had a family, and of course I was told many times that I should be grateful for what I had. No one was really interested in my feelings. The father was on my side, and he gave me strength and also instilled in me this belief that I myself was strong and that there was future for me. Where there's will, there's a way, as they say, but I've always been a very reserved and quiet child. This hasn't changed. Mr. Szymański from Auschwitz, Mr. Zibet from the radio and Dr. Putowska contacted my mother in Krakow, but I didn't know about this. She didn't tell me about this, and I didn't have access to the post either. So uh, that family of mine was surprised why I wouldn't contact them back. My brother, Volodya, arrived and we met in Krakow, and finally my Krakow mother decided to take me to Vitebsk. 
and I had to be grateful again. One thing was positive about all this. My family in Vitebsk received a flat with facilities because I was going back to my home country, uh, Belarus. The surge of interest was good for them. I didn't expect such a welcome. I was amazed when I saw all these people at the railway station. How will I find my family in such a crowd? I thought. I didn't expect that they would all come to welcome us. All eyes were set on me. How will she react? Two mothers. At least I could speak the two different languages. Their gaze told me everything. But unfortunately, I didn't stay there. I came back to Poland. After I finished my studies and an internship, I received an invitation to Vienna through the Maximilian Kolbe work. I also received a very warm welcome from Pax Christi. I was absolutely delighted and I decided to stay there as long as my passport allowed me to. I worked for Caritas. I learned the language and traveled around the country. My last plan was to go to Italy. I met Josef, my husband, and one day before my passport expired, we got married. They took away my Polish citizenship, but I received an Austrian passport. I could visit Poland without any problems, which was particularly important in the 1970s. At the end of the 1960s, my Belarus mother died. In 2005, my older brother died, and then my sister died as well. But I met them very often in the meantime, and I went with my family to Belarus. Only my brother is still alive, but because of his poor health, he couldn't come here this year. Two years ago, he was here with a group of former inmates from Belarus. I'd like to thank you for your kind attention and I would also like to thank all the people from Auschwitz-Birkenau who help us, that they have organized these events for many years. These meetings are extremely important for us. We meet here as one family, we the Auschwitz children. And we feel really welcomed in here. And I'd like to thank as well Maximilian Kolbe Werk because for many years they have helped the former inmates really greatly and we should recognize their great help. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Proszę o zabranie głosu panią Bronisławę Karakulską. a survivor and a former Auschwitz inmate. Witam wszystkich obecnych. Welcome everyone. Z domu Chorowic. My family name is Chorowic. My married name is Karakulska. I come from Kraków. When the Second World War broke out, I was seven and a half years old. And I'm really happy to see here in this place the people who managed to survive it all, to make it despite all various conditions, despite the fact that they couldn't wash themselves, they suffered from hunger and cold, and despite being fearful of another day. All these atrocities were something that my mother felt more than myself, because I was a small child back then. So now I'd like to tell you a short story. 
I was around 50 years old and I went to this Veterans Association in Poland and I had a certificate from Arolzen that I was a former Auschwitz inmate. So I turned to the president of the association and he said that I was an inmate for too short a time to get a war pension and he never signed this certificate, this form. So he, this gentleman, probably never realized that 15 minutes were sufficient to go up in smoke. In Auschwitz, twice was I taken to the crematorium after a selection. The first time I survived because I had swallowed a diamond. Because my mum gave this diamond to a female guard. The second time I survived thanks to my aunt, because thanks to her, they hid me in this copper co fired stove where I stayed for almost two hours. Now, I survived Auschwitz thanks to Oskar Schindler. It was him who convinced Commandant Hess that women and children needed to work in this factory where munitions were produced in Brunitz. So, at this point, I'm the only survivor saved by Schindler who still lives in Krakow. Thank you so very much. Let me now ask the Prime Minister of the Republic of Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki, to take the floor. Honorable survivors, all of you who have gone through this terrible time, Prime Minister, Madam Ambassador, all the members of the Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, this building had a very specific number, but this number and the name didn't tell us anything because the fate of those who were transported in here was also to mean nothing. They were to lose their names, their surnames and their lives. They were given 
Kamp numbers as the number 76307, the number of Bronisława, and the number 77252, the number of Maria. All those who were transported in here received their camp numbers so that they would be murdered or to zamęczyć. toil greatly and be forced to labor tutaj, to death. Auschwitz, to zbrodnie, the które Nazi zła, crimes are the crimes na that elevated the notion of hatred poziom. to unprecedented levels. This notion of evil that was the purest evil against human beings, evil against other nations. Those who were transported in here were to be deprived of humanity. This place should be was to be devoid of humanity. But these weren't those people who were deprived of huma humanity, not Jews, Poles, the Roma, Russians, but those who perpetrated that terrible crime. They deprived themselves of humanity. That terrible crime that took place in here, which took place in here, the, the land that was separated from the world with a barbed wire, well, this crime was also separated from the outer world with an ideology, this grim, horrid, Nazi ideology. And Therefore, there's no consent to any criminal ideology whatsoever, such as German Nazism, such as communism. There's no consent to racism, anti-Semitism, to no such conduct. Therefore, we will remember about all the death mechanisms that were employed at that time because we owe this memory to those living today but even more so to all the victims of those times. In this building and not far from here we could see some bits of clothes and shoes and household utensils, the belongings of those who perished after 15 minutes and this Auschwitz smoke veiled entire Europe and the world and the cries from here resounded around Europe. Jan Karski brought a very detailed report on what the Holocaust was to the United States, to President Roosevelt. But he didn't get a kind ear. They wouldn't listen to him. One of the greatest heroes of the 20th century, Witold Pilecki, he let himself get arrested and went to Auschwitz to be able to write down in great detail a report that was passed to the West by the underground uh, state, Polish state, to the world that was free at that time, mainly to Great Britain. But there was no reaction to that report either. The death camps should be a reminder for us and we should honor them. In Poland, all the sites of German crime 
according to the law, are honored by our memory and reverence. But this is not the case everywhere. There are places in Europe, in other countries, where the sites similar to this one take on or are given a new function. We show no consent to make evil trivialized. Nothing else should be constructed in such sites. They shouldn't serve any other purpose but commemoration. In Poland, we remember this and we'd like all European nations to remember this as well. There are around 20,000 righteous among nations. 20,000 medals were presented to righteous among nations, and 7,000 of them were presented to Poles. However, this doesn't reflect a reality of those times, because in occupied Poland, if you helped a Jew, you would be sentenced to death instantly. And that is why in Yad Vashem, one most important tree is still missing, the tree for Poland, a Polish tree. In Auschwitz, in a place like this, evil showed its grimmest face. It was the most intense. However, it was during that time in such places as Markowa, where the Ulmer family museum uh, is located currently, the family that helped the Jews, or in Ciepielów, where the family of Skoczyles uh, was burned alive, and in other sites in Poland, also the site where the fam uh, Baranek family uh, were executed for helping our Jewish brothers. In such sites, we also see the acts of greatest valor and goodness. Goodness, which at that time was annihilated. Because, yes, this is the lesson we should learn from those times. We didn't help this beautiful nation that uh, lived in Poland to survive, the second largest nation uh, in Poland in those times. We didn't help them because this brutal uh, power wearing brown shirts annihilated the Jewish nation and also part of the Polish nation. That was the German force. And we should keep it as a reminder and we should call the truth and name the truth as it is. A yes should mean a yes and a no should be a no. I believe that at the last judgment all the nations will be judged the way they should be. But this doesn't mean that today we shouldn't fight for a better world, for justice, and for the truth. All of us, all the authorities, the politicians, but also average citizens, faced by the tragedy of the Shoah, should ask ourselves, what should we do next? And it is on the one hand very difficult, but on the other hand very easy to answer this question. We should take our utmost effort and fight for the truth, for justice, and to give hope to the world. Thank you very much.
O zabranie głosu proszę pana ministra Wojciecha Kolarskiego. Minister Wojciech Kolarski tutaj do wkrótce. And the Secretary of State at the Chancellery of the President of the Republic of Poland. Czcigodni ocaleni. Honorable survivors. Panie premierze, panie premierze. Prime Minister. Madam Prime Minister. Your Excellencies. Dostojni goście. All the distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen. Jak co roku. As every year, we come to this place of a terrifying, incomprehensible crime. It is our duty to do so, considering the enormity of suffering that Auschwitz symbolizes. We bow our head, heads before the martyrdom of all those that were imprisoned and murdered behind the barbed wires of the German camps, before the victims of the Holocaust. This crime that can never be compared to any other in the history of humanity, a crime that shocked the humanity and branded the history of the 20th century. It is an honor for me to represent here the President of the Republic of Poland, Mr. Andrzej Duda. I'm speaking on his behalf and I'm expressing the sentiment of my Polish compatriots to say thank you to all those who have arrived here. I bow my head before the survivors. I'm doing that with the deepest respect. I'm talking about the former inmates of the concentration camps. The victims of Auschwitz were Jews. They were citizens of the Republic of Poland and other countries of occupied Europe, as well as Poles, Soviet prisoners of wars of various nationalities, and a Roma. The extermination of Jews during the Second World War took six million human lives. It is truly a terrifying challenge to all of our notions of evil that humans may be capable of. Here in Auschwitz, we can actually understand what German Nazism is. Here, we can see for ourselves that any thoughts, any behavior against our neighbors that breaks the rules of the Ten Commandments, that harks back to this grim, those grim pages of history is a path into the abyss. That is why we must not bound play any of such symptoms, even marginal ones. The Polish state will act decisively in such instances. In the name of the universal human legacy, we, Poles, shall cherish forever the memory of the Holocaust, of the Holocaust victims, and bear testimony, bear witness to German crimes since the very onset. We try to alarm the free world the truth about the Holocaust. And we've heard already the names of Witold Pilecki. We heard about the mission of Jankarski. These are very good examples of how the Polish underground state got involved. Żegota, the council to aid the Jews, also help Jews. Today, just as back then, we remember that three million people perished in the Holocaust. And I'm talking about half of all the victims are were our compatriots, the residents of Poland and Poles and Jews are the special guardians and the depositories of the message that is aimed at the international community. And this duty is discharged by many people milieus and institutions. And the key role is played by the Auschwitz Birkenau State Museum in Auschwitz. And this museum drafted a set of universal principles on how such institutions should operate. And Yad Vashem Institute in Jerusalem is the second such role model of an institution. So we're meeting here in Auschwitz. And we hope that this symbol, this place, will be a mark of our determination never to allow such a tragedy happen again. Let us honor the memory of those who were exterminated in Auschwitz. Let us honor the memory of all the victims of the Holocaust.
Proszę o zabranie głosu jej ekscelencję Anna Azari. Ask Her Excellency Ms. Anna Azari, the ambassador of the Israel to Poland, to take the floor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your kind words for the kind words of the Prime Minister and the representative of the Chancellery. Ladies and gentlemen, I prepared a short speech in which I wanted to thank the Polish government for their swift and decisive reaction on the footage, after the footage on the neo-Nazi organization that was covered by the media for the past week. Unfortunately, I cannot refer to it. I need to refer to what happened in Israel after the amendment to the Act was adopted yesterday. Israel treated it as a possible punishment for those who testified for those who survived the Holocaust. The government of Israel rejects this amendment to the Act on the Institute of National Remembrance. We do hope that we will be able to find a consensus and to introduce changes to this amendment. The State of Israel does understand who built KL Auschwitz and who built other camps as well. And we all know that these were not Poles, but the State of Israel treated this amendment in a way that truth about the Holocaust cannot be uh, spoken out loud and everybody was revolted with this news. So, well, I believe that Poland and Israel are very good friends and that they will find a common language and decide how we will together remember our history. We honor the memory of all those who perished during the Holocaust. Thank you. May I ask His Excellency Sergei Andreev, the Ambassador of the Russian Federation, to take the floor. Survivors, former inmates of the death and concentration camps, Prime Minister, Madam Prime Minister, Ministers, Directors, Colleagues, Ladies and Gentlemen. There are two dimensions to today's ceremony. One of these is the International Day of Commemoration and Memory of the Victims of the Holocaust. The Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp has become a grim symbol of the anti-human nature of Hitler's regime, of the mad theories of racial superiority or inferiority. The German fascists and their collaborators attempt to apply these in practice against Jews by means of the so-called final solution. Also against the Slavs and other nations that lived in Czechoslovakia, in Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Russia, 
and the Baltic states. Those nations were meant to be either exterminated or driven out in accordance with the Eastern Master Plan. There were also many others. And those people felt they had every right to control other people's destinies. The former inmates of the Nazi extermination camps, the survivors, those who made it, are the people that we are special, that we are paying special respects to, as they are the witnesses and the living guardians of the memory of that thing that should never happen again. The other dimension of this date is the 73rd anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp by the Red Army. The extermination was carried out by people, and the Nuremberg tr Tribunal, Humanity and History passed the judgment on them. The extermination machine was also stopped by people, and it is quite right that the International Day of Commemoration of Memory of the Victims of the Holocaust is linked to the day the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp was liberated by the Red Army soldiers. We, in Russia, and the countries of the former USSR, take this opportunity to remember today millions of our compatriots, called Russians, Belarusians, Tatars, Jews, Kazakhs, Georgians, Uzbeks, Azerbaijanis, Moldovans, and representatives of dozens of other nationalities who fought side by side on the fronts of the Great Patriotic War liberating their own countries and the European countries occupied by the Germans. We shall always remember our brothers in arms, Poles, who fought in the ranks of the Polish People's Army side by side with the Red Army, as well as in the ranks of our Western allies. We remember and cherish the contribution made by our allies so that our common enemy could be defeated. In December 2017, the General Assembly of the United Nations yet again passed a resolution on combating the glorification of Nazism and other practices that contribute to fueling contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and rigid intolerance. Unfortunately, even today, there are countries where Nazis raise their heads, where Nazi collaborators are cast as heroes. We're talking about people who murdered civilians only because they had the wrong, they were of wrong nationality. Also, marches with torches of nationalists are organized under the banners of national superiority and intolerance. And where, the, where war is declared on memorials that honor those who fought against fascism. The resolution, UN resolution, was co-authored by 57 countries, 133 voted in favor, unfortunately two countries voted against and 49 abstained, using an excuse the fact that they needed to cherish the freedom of expression. This is the era of post-truth. In these days we see that a political situation and information wars can often distort ideas and misshape the image of good and evil. So, criminals become freedom fighters while liberators are turned into occupiers and the oppressors of freedom. <coughs> Auschwitz is such a place where the tragic past should serve as a harsh lesson to the current and future generations, a place where people should develop immunity to the disease of historical amnesia. This place surely is the place where there should be no doubts about who are the oppressors, who are the victims, and who are the liberators. May the madness of Auschwitz never is repeated. May there be a peaceful sky before all of our heads. Thank you so very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.
Oddaję głos panu dyrektorowi. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now ask the director and the guardian of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial, Piotr Cywiński, to take the floor. Dziś nie ma już wśród nas Primo Levi is no longer with us today, nor are Elie Wiesel, Władysław Bartoszewski, Israel Gutman, Simon Weil, Imre Kertes, and so many others. We, the post-war generation, are left increasingly alone to bear the burden of these people's experiences. And we continue to cope very poorly with this weight on our shoulders. The entire world seems to be living as if it's learned nothing from the tragedy of the Shoah and the concentration camps. We have no effective response to successive instances of genocidal madness. Neither hunger nor death both caused by incessant conflict, are able to inspire our governments and societies to take effective measures. Arms trafficking and the exploitation of working people are placing the poorest regions of the world into the greatest peril. The United Nations Organization offer, offers no hope anymore. The European Union is being undermined by its inner apathy. At the same time, our democracies are suffering in the wake of rising populism, national egotism and new forms of hate speech. Neo-fascist organizations defile our streets and cities. Have we really changed so much in just two or three generations? What is happening to our world? What is happening to us? Doesn't memory carry its own obligations? And if it is hope that dies last, then what should this hope be rooted in if not in memory? Is there still room for the memory of victims in a culture that tries to live without awareness of death? Do we really need to deplore a lack of vision to justify our shallowness in strengthening what is good? Will opinion polls and social media memes dictate our choices forever? Does the market really need only those who are sure of their inalienable right to live conveniently, forgetting at the same time about their not always convenient obligations? Is the sum of human complacency the most reasonable gauge of what is good in our world? When it was as plain as day that education was incompatible with contemporary challenges, why were we unable to change it? Is the ratio of the number of, for instance, math lessons to the number of such classes as ethics, the wise use of the mass media, social studies, knowledge of internal societal threats, the ability to organize civic protests and to develop aid programs really Justifiable? Is this ratio really justifiable? Do we really want to build our future on integrals? Why do history classes teach us only about the past in a play-safe manner without showing any clear links between the past and the present and also an increasingly uncertain future? We don't want to answer these questions ourselves. It's easier to put them to one side, deride or discredit them. And it really doesn't matter what happens in Congo, in Burma, in a neighboring district or the stadium nearby. 
We've become apathetic, not because we have no great visions for the future, but because we have made our common and collective and even our most recent past oblique. This apathy is so profound that today, perhaps for the first time in the history of humanity, when judging the course of events in so many places in the world, both far away and closer to home, it's hard for us to tell the difference between what's peace and what's already war. Is it possible that Auschwitz hasn't taught us anything? I believe that all of us should look for the answer to this question in their own conscience. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the staff and the volunteers will help you to leave this room and go to the monument. The second part of the commemoration will take place there, a joint prayer and a tribute.